The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the Racial Equity Webinar Series. I'm Kinkini Banerjee and I'm so glad to have you join us for this session. I'm the Coalition Relations Director at USBC. And this series is uh, funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and it's a bi-monthly webinar series. And the purpose is to improve our collective learning about the principles of social and racial justice, equity and inclusion, so we are able to elevate our action around access, equity, justice, and how it impacts our own programming and our organizations. So the ability and uh, to acknowledge and work with issues of um, health inequity are uh, a core competency of leadership today. And this is a forum where we have the opportunity to engage about um, issues related to um, disparities and inequities in our community. <clears throat> so if you're not already um, on our part of our racial equity learning community, I hope you'll join today. So this learning community includes this webinar series that we have. We also have a moderated discussion forum for community participants. So we hope that the conversation doesn't end with the end of our session today, but continues on the discussion forum. We also have a file library and we keep curating good information and articles and uh, resources to share. So um, the, uh, the racial equity learning community, if you go to our website, um, click the second tab, which says news and info, click on it and it opens up a whole bunch of learning communities. We have more than 20 um, uh, learning communities on the Surgeon General's call to action topics and more, and the racial equity is one of these as well. So all of our webinar materials for today, as well as our previous ones are on that, uh, on our webinar page on our website, and it's www.usbreastfeeding.org slash equity dash community. Again, you should have this link in the um, confirmation email that you got and also post uh, webinar session, you're going to get a follow up email, you're going to have this link there. It's a direct link to the web page where you can download materials. And uh, Dene has also chatted the link in the chat box. So you can go there and click. So during we have a large number of participants today and um, um, all uh, participants are in listen-only mode uh, as we need to keep the audio quality clear. However, we hope this session will be as interactive as possible given this format. So please share your insights and questions throughout the session. We'll have, we'll have about 20 minutes for Q&A at the end, but we hope to hear from you throughout the session. And here's how you do it. You should see a control panel on the right of your screen. If you don't see it, it, will, it might be minimized. So click on that orange um, tab with the white arrow and it'll pop back out and go through the different tabs and just under the um, audio tab is the one for questions. If you click on that tab, it opens up a text box for you to open, to type into. And um, I'll be sure to pass on your questions to our panelists um, um, as, um, when we uh, pause for Q&A. During this session, if you have any audio or other technical questions, please email office at usbreastfeeding.org and our staff will be able to help you. And that brings me to today's topic, infant and young um, child feeding during emergencies. This is, this takes, um, this is a topic that we've been planning to bring you for a few months now, especially in the aftermath of all of the um, natural events, disasters that occurred in 2017. Infants and young children are particularly vulnerable during emergencies, damage to critical infrastructure, you know, such as roads, railway, shipping, transportation, basic services like power, water, communication, limits access to nutritious food, clean water, you know, basic services and urgent healthcare and causing much greater hardships for families with infants and young children. Um, natural disasters impact short and long-term health outcomes in communities. And um, we know 
Um, and there's reams of research to show that disasters uh, have been known to disproportionately affect rural and communities of color due to systemic barriers that make these communities more susceptible. So prevention and preparedness are key to ensuring that infants and children have the best opportunity to survive and thrive. And this session, during today's session, we have a great panel of speakers and we'll pro provide context for infant and young child feeding in natural disasters. We'll highlight um, um, the role of federal and local agencies. We'll highlight the role of communities in preparedness and also um, current research. Um, so you'll hear ground level realities from the perspectives of um, for health professionals and community members who were uh, who were actually on the ground during hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria. So I am honored to have an amazing panel with us today. Felicia Flyde um, is um, is um, our is chair of the National Associ uh, Association of Professional and Peer Lactation Supporters of Color. She is. And um, I'll be doing more detailed introductions just before their sections, but she also serves on the board of the USBC and is a leader's leader, truly um, uh, an activist, a health professional um, who is able to do so much um, in her many, many roles um, in the first food field. Uh, Kat Sheely, Catherine Sheely is from CDC and um, has uh, for those of us in USBC's network, she's seen, uh, you know, she, we think of Kat Sheely and we think of um, the CDC report cards and MPing. Kat is working on emergency um, at the DNPAO right now. Um, Anjali Palmquist, Dr. Anjali Palmquist is from the UNC um, um, in Gillings School of Public Health and the Carolina Breastfeeding, um, Global Breastfeeding Institute. Uh, Lourdes is from Puerto Rico and the executive director <coughs> of um, um, and the executive director of um, well, let me get that right. Alimentación Segura Infantil. Uh, Tracy Erickson is from Texas WIC. So with that, I'm going to um, start with Catherine Sheely first. And Catherine, um, you are on. I'm going to pull your slide. Thank you, Kinkini, very much. Um, I'm really glad to be able to be here today. Um, I am only remotely here, so uh, Kinkini, do you have the slides up? Yes, just a second. Okay, so um, many of you know me uh, from my usual role and, and hat at CDC um, in the Division of Nutrition and Physical Activity and Obesity in the Nutrition Branch and the Infant Feeding Team. Um, for this past year, I've been on a detail assignment to CDC's uh, Division of Emergency Operations on um, the Medical Investigations Team, um, which is then uh, activated into a task force during an emergency response. Um, and so um, during the so today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the context and considerations of infant emergencies using um, CDC's response in the 2017 hurricanes um, as something of a case study. Uh, next slide. So uh, just an overview of sort of how this, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, the, so for context and considerations, um, a very brief overview of sort of how emergency response works sort of the capital letter, letter versions of those. Um, and then the case study, as I mentioned before, of Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria. Um, so you go to the next slide. Um, this, is, this is how it's gonna work today. And I wanted to sort of map it out Candyland style for you so you could follow along because I know it's kind of tricky when everybody's remote. So I'm gonna start with talking, um, sharing with you so, some uh, context and, and um, what we know from the data about infant feeding characteristics in Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands um, before the hurricane, and this is um, our from the National Immunization Survey, and then from 
to, and that's, and I want to give you that first so that you kind of have it in the back of your head as I'm going through the overview of the roles of the federal agencies overall and then see in particular so that that can be sort of marinating as part of the context and then come back to um, some of the experience in Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands in the hurricanes this year in terms of the timeline and some of the considerations. Next slide. Um, so now you should have in front of you a slide about of the breastfeeding rates at birth, six and 12 months among U.S. infants born in 2014 in U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, Puerto Rico, and overall. And um, probably most people um, on the phone are familiar with these um, data. They come from CDC's National Immunization Survey. And um, I think it's just sort of, this is to me sort of the biggest picture context of how what kind of information um, is important to have in the back of your head when you're looking at what are the impeding factors um, and, and issues in any uh, environment when, when an emergency situation happens. So what is sort of the, you know, the background prevalence, so to speak. So the, the, to walk you through this, the, the wider band for each of those, any breastfeeding at birth six and 12 months is what is the US overall average? So on average, in the United States, initiation is now at about 83%, and the highest state in the U.S. is at 93%, and the lowest is at 58 So you can see the green and blue bands for initiation. Both Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands have pretty high initiation, relatively speaking. Um, they're not the tippy top, but they're, they're really very high initiation, which means the background population that's affected, the vast majority of those babies at least started breastfeeding. And when you look at any breastfeeding at six months, who um, they're sort of right there in the middle. They're not the lowest, but they're not the highest. But you have in U.S. Virgin Islands, about half of babies are breastfeeding at all at six months and um, about almost 40 percent in Puerto Rico. And then at 12 months at, at a year, um, again, you, know, you see that they're actually a little bit lower than what would be sort of the U.S. average, um, you know, 28 percent and 21 percent. So you start to wonder, well, you know, what's what's really going on? How how can we unpack that a little bit more? Because that's really sort of that that proverbial thirty thousand foot view. If you go on the next slide, and you look at the NIS data that we have about formula supplementation. So in other words, among babies who are breast who are breastfed at all, how many of them get any formula at all within the first forty eight hours? Which really, in many ways, is sort of a proxy for what's going on in the hospital which tells you a little bit about the infrastructure going on that, that is available in that area. Formula supplementation within the first 48 hours, or early supplementation, is extraordinarily high in U.S. Virgin Islands. So this uh, chart here shows the prevalence of formula supplementation in the first 48 hours in each U.S. state and territory that we have data for from the National Immunization Survey ranked in order of prevalence. So the gray bar shows you what's the U.S. average, and you can see relative to the other states, U.S. Virgin Islands not only has the highest rate of early supplementation, but it's extraordinarily higher than any other state. Whereas Puerto Rico, yes, is, is, is very, very high, but there are others that are in that same general range on the very high end. If you go to the next slide, you can see, well, what's going on with continued formula supplementation? So how many breastfed babies are being supplemented at six months or within the first six, I'm sorry, three months? Um, and again, U.S. Virgin Islands really stands out. So the lighter green on this uh, chart is actually that first 48 hours. And then what we've been here is added on, stacked on top of it, the three-month supplementation. So that lower, the, the shorter green bar that doesn't have any words over it, that shows you just to give you a sense of, of relatively speaking, where the early supplementation was. And the green bar that's sort of right in the middle of this slide, this is Puerto Rico, 26%. So 26% of breastfed babies in Puerto Rico are supplemented within the first three months. And 45% of breastfed babies in U.S. Virgin Islands are supplemented within the first three months. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind because if that, that is something that's definitely a factor for the families that need to be handling um, infant feeding and care after the hurricane. If you continue the next slide, that sh this shows you a little bit more. Yet again, U.S. Virgin Islands has the highest rate of supplementation among breastfed babies at six months or within the first six months. Puerto Rico is a little bit higher than the national average, but but I'm sorry, I, that's not true. The Puerto Rico is at the national average, so they are next to each other because they're the same, so they're ranked in, in order. Um, so both 
you know, 34% of breastfed babies on Puerto Rico were supplemented with formula within the first six months and 52% in U.S. Virgin Islands. So that's the sort of context of breastfeeding to keep in the back of your head as we move on to the next section. So on the um, next slide, it says NIMS overview. So NIMS, what is NIMS? Shifting gears a little bit here to the context of emergency response. NIMS is the National Incident Management System. It was implemented um, in the post-Katrina era, um, recognizing that there was a need for a cohesive infrastructure um, that could be used to guide how agencies uh, respond to emergencies. So who is it for? It's really, it's to help enable all of the different agency partners, federal, state, tribal, local, territorial, and the private sector and non-governmental organizations be able to work together. So literally everyone's singing from the same playbook, as they say, or the hymnal or whatever analogy works best. Um, in order to be able to better prepare for, prevent, respond, mitigate all the different phases of emergency preparedness, management, and response. Um, and it's and it really, of course, the overarching goal is to help the response be more effective and to mitigate loss of life and property and, of course, harm to the environment. Next slide. Um, as you know, the federal government especially really likes acronyms, so um, I apologize for the many acronyms. But um, a couple that are really important, especially in terms of infant feeding, are related to the ESF. So within NIMS, the National Incident Management System, there are emergency support functions. There's many. I'm not going to get into how many there are. Um, but the point of them is to have a very, a, a very clear predetermined role for all of the different federal, state, and local agencies, sort of essentially defining everybody's lane. And that helps ensure that everybody understands what their own role is, what someone else's role is, how they're supposed to work together, um, so that everybody has the same information in front of them so that if they have a question of, oh, how do I address X problem, they can look in, okay, who's, who, where does that fall in the ESF? And, oh, it falls under this ESF, and so I can go to this agency, and they have a better idea of how they can get the information that they need. In the context of CDC, CDC is the lead for ESF-8, which is medical care and public health in an emergency response. There's other um, times when other agencies take on leadership, but in responding to a disaster emergency, CDC is the lead for ESF-8. Um, that said, in any emergency, the local agency is always in charge. So what that means is that when the local agency needs help, the other agencies step in to help. So the reason that I'm pointing this out is that food is not part of medical care and public health. And this is one of the complexities of breastfeeding. And it's a really important other conversation that's not really for today, but I wanted to put that out there so that can be something percolating in the back because one of the very tricky things is making sure that there's close coordination across emergency support functions. So switching gears now to the next slide that starts with uh, the 2017 North Atlantic hurricane season. Um, so you may remember we had a very exciting fall um, and it was really pretty unprecedented. It wasn't, you know, it didn't just seem that way. It really was. Um, half of all the tracked storms that, um, that NOAA tracked, the National um, Oceanographic um, and Aeronautic Administration tracked, um, actually made landfall in the United States, which is extremely rare. Four of them landed in Texas, three in Puerto Rico, two in USA and Florida, and one um, in landed in six U.S. states. So this map shows you all of the storms that basically made it up to the level of being worthy of essentially making it onto the news. Um, and one in four of them became major hurricanes. Um, we sort of had a joke around CDC that Jose was a big staker. Um, because he had us very nervous and, you know, that he was just sort of this flaky, uh, you know, younger sibling that didn't quite know what he was going to do. Um, so the, the, this was a very, very busy season. Not only that, um, but the timing, if you go to the next slide, you can see the calendar. The timing of them was pretty remarkable. So um, those of you who remember um, Katrina and Rita, that seems pretty close together. 
Um, compared to these, that was nothing because there were several weeks in between Katrina and Rita. Um, whereas we had Harvey and then really just a few days later, Irma hit and then just a very few days later, Maria hit. So the, and the map is highlighted there to show you that those, that's where those storms all hit and they all hit in the same places. And so differentiating, well, is this damage from Harvey? Is this damage from Irma? Is this from Maria? In some places, it's a little bit easier to see, but in, when it comes to Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands, it's really, um, it, it, it gets very muddy very quickly. Um, I believe we are now going to the next slide of a map. Is that true? Yes. Okay. So the next slide is a map that um, that is a pretty cool, um, I think it's pretty cool. So one of the things that we're able to do when we're responding to emergencies at CDC is really leverage the expertise that we have across the entire agency and um, and and make use of the sort of Venn diagrams of data and information and expertise that we have. So there um, is a remarkable team within the emergency division emergency operations that does um, a whole bunch of um, GIS and mapping kinds of functions. And one of the things that we really needed to find out in the very early days after um, the emergency, after the hurricanes on Puerto Rico was where were all the babies being born? Because the information that we were getting um, from the other agencies about, you know, with the power loss, et cetera, et cetera, um, it, they, everyone was having a very hard time figuring out where people were. Um, and so we were actually able to take um, information that we had gathered for Zika about the WIC clinics because there was a partnership with the WIC clinics to do Zika education and the maternity hospitals that we know from CDC information and find out where would moms and babies be in the early days after the hurricanes. And then that then helped to be able to inform FEMA about how it would make the most sense to be able to provide support to those populations. And so this is just an example um, of a map that we were able to create with our GIS folks. So we fed them the data and they spit it out as this really cool map. Um, and we then were able to find out who had electricity and who didn't. So um, it was really kind of like a game of clue. So you can see the pink ones. Um, so this was a map that um, you can see the date here, this was October, early October, that all we knew was that we weren't getting newborn screening information uh, from these, this handful of hospitals. And so we were using that as a proxy to say that probably their, the rest of their functionality in mother baby units um, was also compromised because everybody else had been able to get newborn screening information to us. So it was sort of like, okay, well, if you can't get the information you need, what else hangs together with it? And that was a pretty cool, um, kind of opportunity that we had. And we ended up using this map with um, for a lot of our partnership activities that we did throughout the rest of the response. Um, to, in closing, I just wanted to um, kind of go through two, two more slides um, that are not rocket science to anybody on this um, webinar, to be sure, um, but are important to kind of show because these are, this is a level of um, concreteness and sort of basic information that is was has been necessary to communicate with the rest of the emergency response partners in making sure that the needs of these perinatal dyads stays um, on the radar because when we're working in an emergency response context we often are there there is one maybe two people in a group of you know 70 80 90 um, working in the response who have a lens towards mother baby needs. Um, and so it's, it's, we end up really needing to walk them through very, very clearly. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, if a mother's concern is she doesn't feel comfortable breastfeeding in a shelter, it might seem logical to, oh, well then we can give her a bottle or we can give her a pump. Um, but they really need help being walked through. Well, actually, that doesn't solve the problem. If you feel uncomfortable breastfeeding in a shelter, you're probably going to feel really uncomfortable pumping in a shelter. And giving a bottle of something, of anything, is not going to help in the big picture. So 
that level of complexity is something that is very, very new to them. And so making these very drilled down lists of here are the things that mothers and babies need um, and staying at this very broad level that's really sort of the, the, the absolute critical things has been very helpful. So we made this list of, you know, here are what mother baby dyads need in those early days. They need assessment of infant feeding status and access to the kinds of support that they need. They need protection of a secure space so that they can take care of their babies. They need space allocated to do these things. So this is what, may, in other words, very, very high level, this is what makes them different. And leaving out a delineation of a breastfeeding mom needs this and another mom needs this is really important in this context because um, that delineation between who is only breastfeeding and who is mixed feeding and who is not breastfeeding at all is a very fluid time. And so instead, treating that population as one population and assuming the need for the kinds of support that would also be supportive of anybody, no matter how they're feeding their baby, um, is really important in terms of sort of feasibility and pragmatic um, support. In other words, if you actually wanted anything to get carried out, it needs to be very simple. Um, and then the next slide of sort of some very, very basic things of what parents need and infants need. So um, really, really basic that, you know, what makes parents different from adults? that don't have children. They, you know, yes, everybody needs space to rest and sleep, um, but they also need, the, they need to be able to have sort of this consideration of these other things that are going to affect their ability to care for themselves because they're also caring for their unit that is their people. And infants need clean, safe space that is different um, from what somebody who, is not an infant would need. And so those are, these are just some examples that I thought would be helpful in the context of uh, the rest of the um, talks this afternoon. And um, that's all I have for this turbo talk today. Great, thank you, Catherine. <clears throat> and as Catherine says, like the, um, these plans and processes and protocols are so important to have and yet um, on, on the ground when you have thousands of evacuated, uh, uh, thousands of people displaced and evacuees and shelters sometimes moving six, seven times. And you see coordination of services in some place, fragmentation of services in, um, in other place. Um, it, it needs everybody to come together and just so much of the, uh, um, it, it falls on the local agencies and the communities to do. So I am going to um, <clears throat> move on to our next speaker. And I am so um, honored to present uh, Felicia Floyd. Um, today, Felicia is is an author, speaker, trainer, consultant, and award-winning hospital-based IBCLC celebrated for her work in racial equity and food justice. She's the owner of Beyond Breastfeeding and the foundation of uh, and the founder of Our Brown Baby. Like I said, she's the uh, president of Naples C, is an active member of Center for Social Inclusion's Race Forward First Food um, Racial Equity Cohort. Uh, she is, uh, you know, has a storied career start with a, as a peer counselor a breastfeeding coordinator with WIC and she also works as a consultant with the Boston Medical College's the CHAMPS program that's funded by the Keller Foundation. She still consults with WIC. Uh, she serves in multiple roles, was an advisor um, in the World Breastfeeding Trends Initiative and is the education director for mom to mom Global and her championing of families is additionally informed by Felicia's important role as an Air Force active duty military spouse and a proud mom of three breastfed children. So welcome, Felicia. And I'm going to pull off your slides right now as you get started. Wonderful. Thank you, Ken Kenny. I appreciate you introducing me. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope that this webinar brings good spirits and informed information to you so we can be prepared. I am the chair of Naplesee. 
um, the National Association for Professional and Peer Black Patient Supporters of Color. Do you see my slides now? Yes, I see. So NAPLC had the opportunity to partner um, with Safely Fed USA during the devastating hurricane season of 2017. Our mission is to create and cultivate a community of um, support for diverse lactation professionals to inform um, and transform communities of colors with skilled lactation care uh, through policy and development with breastfeeding in order to decrease disparities in breastfeeding in communities of color. So unique to this, um, we immediately noticed at NAPLC the great disparity with um, discussing logistics and messaging to get support to communities of color. There um, was great effort by the lactation community, specifically with Safely Fed USA. Um, many of our our organizations um, partnered and we immediately noticed that there was a lack of, uh, there was language barriers, there was lack of representation. Um, there, there wasn't a lens given to um, focus on the inequities that face when communities of colors are, are um, prepared or facing natural disasters and emergencies. So with that being stated, we know from our work in the field, um, specifically with First Foods Racial Justice, um, the way our structural system is set, set up that um, communities of color specifically are vulnerable. Um, many times the residents are in communities that are in low lying sections. We have unfortunately had the experience of that with Katrina and how that impacted communities of color specifically, that example. We knew that it was important that messaging is inclusive. We noticed that many of the messages were in English only and that lens was not given to specifically to other, um, other um, 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 victims of the, the season to get messaging across specifically about infant feeding. We do know from the statistics that communities of color are uh, um, disproportionately uh, underrepresented with uh, the, the, the barriers in this, that's in place for breastfeeding, specifically um, black women and breastfeeding, black families and breastfeeding are um, the lowest. So combined with the barriers that are faced every day with uh, racial racial barriers with structural barriers with systems of structural racism in place um, we knew we had to move quickly and do something we wanted to raise awareness to this by getting stories from our communities so that we can make that that heart to action connection um, and also representation and different messaging that went out we had a group of wonderful volunteers to come together and create um, means and to create messaging. We quickly also wanted to point out and to make the messaging inclusive of all um, cultures and not messaging and pictures used from disasters. We did not, we wanted to be sensitive to that. We didn't want to um, re-stimulate postpartum stress and um, how that would impact when they see messaging um, <clears throat> and trying to prepare their family. We do, um, we did keep in mind as well that food structure and food insecurity is a huge barrier for communities of colors. With that being said, the infrastructure in, in our neighborhoods and residents, um, such as the drainage, for instance, in many neighborhoods are a big epidemic, so we would be the first ones impacted it's communities of color when early weather was taking place. The <clears throat> volunteers quickly came together to create a beautiful statement that really enforced and centered the lens of communities of color. 
one of the stories that we were able to gather from our communities is from um, Brittany Perry. She was, a, she is a resident, if you can go back to that slide. Um, she is a resident of Houston, Texas. She tells the story of how she was um, unfortunately in the midst of Hurricane Harvey and she had a two month old baby in her arms and she had to go to higher grounds. And what she had to do was hold her babies in her arm, her baby in her arm and, and she had no car seat. So she had to get as many people as possible and, and to leave in the SUV. And so they were able to evacuate, but she shared her story with the sense that breastfeeding essentially saved the fact that she was breastfeeding um, and, and essentially saved her family and her infant. Um, during this time of disaster was very profound. And when we think of natural disasters and infant feeding, unfortunately, what we quickly realize in examining different coalitions and different state agencies, that there isn't very much training or um, accessi accessibility to um, the volunteers to uh, get training at, at different um, shelters. So, <coughs> We knew that from the stories being heard from the field that when our communities of colors evacuate that they're not able to, or, or possibly not able to have access to how to sustain their milk supply, um, if they're mixed feeding, how to mix feed safely. Um, what does that look like? We also know that the fact that the evacuation in itself is a privilege. Um, many communities, um, do, cannot afford and here living in a panhandle of Florida, um, definitely realizing the, the impact of evacuation and how urgent and um, quickly that needs to take place. And typically in communities of color, research shows that that barrier, that financial barrier it takes to evacuate impacts communities of color um, disproportionately. Um, we do know that after natural disasters, um, communities of color also um, die at, at higher rates than, and than, than white people. Um, and also with a native lens for our native um, communities, we do know that many of the tribes are state recognized, but not federally recognized, which causes a barrier for them to get federal disaster aid. And <clears throat> the fact that the postpartum um, the, not postpartum, sorry, post-traumatic stress disorder um, is, is so su susceptible. We're so susceptible that after um, a natural disaster is alarming. In addition to the stressors as being a person of color and walking through the world um, as a person of color with the systemic um, barriers and racism and inequities that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. So all of these layers um, encouraged us to create a statement. And can Kenny, if you can give me presenter privilege so I can. Sure. So this is um, the NAPLC website. I'd encourage you all to um, visit it. This is our statement. And the beautiful portion about our statement is we knew that we had to act as a collective impact and get um, perspective from communities that center First Foods and communities of color. So along with Health Connect One and Reaching Our Sisters Everywhere Rose, we were able to collectively, so they were able to come and support the statement as well. And we were able to collectively create a statement to disseminate out to other organizations as they go forth and support um, vulnerable communities and at-risk communities. And during the, har the hurricane season of 2017. So this resource is available and it's under the resources tab here. Uh, if you want to read it at a later time, I really encourage you all to and sign on as well. Can Kenny, you can. Yes, I'll, and we'll post the link for it too in the chat box. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you for that, Kim Kenny. Um, I will give you back presenter privileges. Great. Thank you, uh, Felicia. And so if you haven't read this, take some time off when you get this link and read this um, infant feeding statement. It is a testament to how galvanized the community was in, in, in bringing together and showing really how um, how we need to have communities at the center of a, any purposes. As, as Felicia just said, that rescue workers are often not trained in breastfeeding support management. The, mm -hmm. planes, the planes and buses are the first ones to leave and the, uh, the communities that are left are often are the ones that have the most underinvestment in any kind of infrastructure. So, um, yes, yes. If you can go advance to the next slide, please. So we also were able through this um, partnership and collaboration and collective impact um, organize, um, assist to organize volunteers to go out and support um, um, specifically this, this meme that you're seeing here is for um, those in Texas and to send out help. And we knew that it was important to be inclusive of all strategies, um, all, all um, credentialing and strategize together to reach our communities that weren't gonna be able to, or feared going to shelters for different reasons. Um, the realities of our community specifically are, are communities that may not want to seek assistance for fear of, um, being deported um, for fear of um, their children being taken away from them, um, and and for fear of retriggering the systemic um, unfortunate events that's taken place in the lives of communities of color. So we were able to have oh I think it was forty volunteers sign up, um, which was profound and also was able to help with the helpline as well. If you would go to the next slide, please. Um, and that concludes our um, portion of the equity lens and communities of color and natural disaster. We have um, several memes available that I am going to upload to USBC website, but they're also available to our Facebook. We encourage you to seek out um, any type of questions you may have or, or further information or statistics that you would like um, at my email address or my phone number, or you can contact us on social media and we're on Twitter as well. Great, thank you so much, Felicia. And sorry, I, I uh, cut you off before I thought you were done. So, um, not knowing the sequence, uh, but uh, thanks again. Just be sure to check that um, link and um, and check out the infant feeding statement from Napolsi. Um, I am really honored to um, present our next speaker, uh, Tracy Erickson. As you know, Hurricane Harvey hit Texas on August 25th. Uh, 2017, and Tracy is the state with breastfeeding coordinator um, with the uh, with Texas WIC. She's the manager of the infant feeding branch at the Texas WIC program, with over 19 years of experience designing and managing state programs and initiatives to promote breastfeeding support. Tracy oversees all of the infant feeding. Um, programs in the state of Texas, and we know how much of the resources from Texas we've been sharing. So take it away, Tracy. I'm going to pull up your slide. Thank you, Kenny, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk about the successes we had in partnerships we used to get Texas WIC clinics and families back on their feet quickly after the devastation of Harvey. Um, Ken Kenny asked us to start by sharing perspectives from our vantage of what is important about infant and young child feeding in emergencies. And obviously promotion, protection, and support of breastfeeding is way up there. But in a nation that doesn't have paid maternity leave and doesn't have lactation um, consultant reimbursement, uh, insurance reimbursement, um, has less than stellar hospital practices and a lot of other barriers, um, 
support for mo our moms who are formula feeding is obviously um, right up there as well. And in Texas, while our WIC initiation rates are very high at about 87%, our WIC exclusive breastfeeding rates at three months are only about 18%. And then safe infant feeding in general, or as safe as possible, is also very important in emergencies. Uh, we just w uh, had changed our WIC clients facing uh, materials on formula, safe formula prep to be in alignment with the WHO and CDC safe formula prep guidance. But um, it wasn't always possible to boil water after Harvey, as you will hear more about. I believe one of our um, biggest successes was uh, uh, really just good, good preparation. Uh, in the two days prior to landfall, uh, we instructed our local agency directors to review local agency and state of Texas WIC disaster plans, which we feel are developed pretty well because in the not too distant past, too distant past, we have dealt with Katrina, Rita, Ike. And um, so the goal, uh, the, the goal of the, the Texas WIC disaster plan is to get WIC clinics up and running as quickly as possible after the disaster. And the guidance um, includes information on securing work areas and computers, um, uh, promoting, uh, protecting and supporting breastfeeding, replacing WIC benefits, including food, uh, formula, and breast pumps. We also reached out to our directors in those two days prior to update our point of contact disaster um, list, contact list. And uh, we emailed uh, an IT risk mitigation plan to our local agencies with instructions for protecting their MIS and uh, computer equipment, like moving computers up off the floor, covering um, equipment and plastic, running backups uh, to disks. And then we blanketed um, our Facebook and, and, and Twitter accounts with social media posts with links to uh, CDC's preparedness for expecting a new parents website, um, referring moms to our 24 seven Texas lactation support hotline, which is answered on weekends, holidays, in the middle of the night. Um, and we reached out to our 211 op operators to redirect, uh, to remind them to redirect our breastfeeding, any breastfeeding mothers needing assistance to the Texas Lactation Support Hotline. So then Harvey hit and um, Houston and the surrounding area, um, really all the way over to the Louisiana border, received 46 or more inches of rain in five days and they were underwater for weeks afterwards. Uh, 24 hospitals were evacuated, 61 communities lost drinking water, 23 ports were closed, 781 roads were impassable, and nearly 780,000 Texans had evacuated their homes. And in the days after the storm, more than 42,000 Texans were housed temporarily in 692 shelters. So in the first few days after, um, it hit on uh, Saturday and on Sunday, our WIC program director and our director of nutrition education and clinic services began daily phone calls to our local agency directors to check their status and to ask what they needed to get back on their feet and to get back open again. And um, once again, we blanketed our social media outlets um, with um, instructions to call the lactation support hotline um, for moms needing breastfeeding assistance or, or moms who have a newborn and didn't have access to safe water or formula and wanted help breastfeeding. And, um, and social media posts to inform them that they will, will get uh, WIC replacement benefits. So our Texas Lactation Support Hotline after that um, kind of blew up. We, we, um, that, that hotline is manned by 16 IBCLCs across the state. Um, and they, uh, in the next two or three days, received many, many calls. But, um, and, um, and they were able to help some breastfeeding moms. But the majority of the calls were moms asking for formula and water. Um, these were formerly breastfeeding moms because our initiation rates are, are so high, but they were not no longer breastfeeding and, and they didn't have uh, a lot of success um, convincing moms to try relactation. <laughs> or um, So it was a, a really huge call for formula and water. Uh, local agency staff who could get to the shelters um, set up WIC and lactation services in the shelters. They focused on the mega shelters because 
uh, the smaller shelters started shutting down pretty quickly in um, the early days after, and, and they were consolidating folks into the mega shelters, which by far had the biggest capacity, especially the George Albert R. Brown Convention Center in Houston. And um, we also had private practice IBCLCs in Dallas and Austin reach out to um, offer to volunteer, and they worked in the mega shelters as well. Uh, some new moms and families with babies were stranded at home, and many didn't have electricity, safe water, cars. There was an estimated 1 million cars destroyed from the flooding. So even if their cars weren't destroyed, they couldn't go far. If they could get out, um, they often uh, could not um, get through on, on roads. And, um, and if they could get through on the roads, nearly 100 of our WIC um, grocery vendors were closed as of September 1st. So stores were either destroyed, had destroyed stock, or ran out of stock. And delivery trucks couldn't get in. And even our vendors were running out of supply and they were having forecasting difficulties because of the shifts in need because there was a big demand from in Dallas and Austin and, and San Antonio surrounding areas from the shelters there. Uh, in the later days as WIC clinics started to open again, some were open but not fully functional, some card reader writers weren't working so we couldn't write benefits to the cards in some, some clinics. Uh, many roads were still impassable, stores were closed or out of stock, and we were offered and we took small donations of ready-to-use formula because that was the only way to get formula to some of our formula feeding moms. Our community partners were, um, uh, our four, we had four profit community partners, obviously. Hygieia um, do actually donated breast pumps to the mega shelters, but uh, the formula companies really did come to our rescue. We, we could not ask for donations, but we could tell them where donations were needed. And we, we needed them in our own clinics because we weren't fully up and operating. Um, and they also delivered to the uh, shelters. Our nonprofit community partners were the Red Cross. The Red Cross did a fabulous job of setting up private mom and baby spaces in the mega shelters. and um, Life Houston is another uh, nonprofit in Houston that provides emergency formula. They were closed for a long time, but, uh, for, a, for a few days, but they began opening about the same time what clinics did. And then Walmart allowed us to partner with them to open up temporary WIC mobile clinics in their sites until the, until, um, the WIC clinics could be restored and safe to access again. We also added a ready-to-use uh, ready formula um, to a, a, a WIC code for our clients with no or limited access to safe water or um, immunocompromised compromised newborns. And then we had some big therapeutic formula cha challenges. Um, for example, we had a baby on Nutricia who was stuck at home. She, her car was flooded. Um, but she was able to eventually catch a ride out of our neighborhood and get to Galveston. And one of our WIC only grocers uh, voluntarily drove a, a can, uh, some sample cans of formula to her until her dropship could be completed. We had a mom on September 1st um, who uh, needed pure amino for her special needs baby. And um, our grocery, our, our WIC only vendor, again, was trying to get the formula to her. Um, but she was in a very problematic area and um, they were unable to get it to her. And um, the DME that was working on her dropship reached out to a mom to mom Facebook group in her area. And someone in the Facebook group happened to have access to a few cans of, the, of Pure Amino and a helicopter. And they helicoptered the formula down to the client's house. And um, so that was definitely a success story. And, and then um, we had a breastfeeding support challenge in the Dallas, Dallas Convention Center. Um, as I said, Red Cross did a great job setting up a mom and baby space. However, it was set up um, within the medical clinic there. And um, after several days, the Dallas County Health Department's chief epidemiologist came through um, to do surveillance and was um, expressed concern that there was a lactation room within the medical clinic, given the types of illnesses they were beginning to see within the clinic themselves. 
and as a result, they recommended to the Office of Emergency Management that it be moved and then um, turned into an isolation area for concern of, uh, for communicable diseases. Um, there were four, four or five mama pods that they were able to use um, rather than uh, uh, developing an isolation area, and that's what ended up happening, but lesson learned um, for big shelters. Uh, we also were able to place an emergency order for WIC breast pumps on the last day of the fiscal year with our remaining funds because we were anticipating big losses of, of pumps in our WIC clinics. And then um, um, Anjali of Safely Fed, who's going to speak later, reached out to us on September 4th to offer uh, to connect us with um, additional um, breastfeeding counselors to um, work in our shelters. At that time, the shelters were starting to shut down. They were, everyone was consolidated into the mega shelters and we had plenty of, of uh, volunteers and, um, and lactation support. And so we um, encouraged them to redirect their focus on Florida since Hurricane Irma was heading their way. And the last thing I wanna share is that we have a, a lot of wonderful uh, materials on our Texas WIC catalog. If you just Google Texas WIC catalog, all of our materials are downloadable. And um, we also have an infant feeding and disasters uh, website on our Department of State Health Services page that um, has a poster that's not on our catalog right now because we're working on revising it. Great, thank you so much, Tracy. And just, uh, you know, Tracy's words really um, reinforce how important it is to <clears throat> make sure that more and more of our moms are breastfeeding um, so that uh, you know just the kind of issues one runs into with uh, in formula uh, you know where is the clean drinking water where are sterile environments how do you clean and how do you and the hoops that you all went through to give your moms what they needed at that time was um, terrific and we just need to keep getting our breastfeeding rates up so that uh, moms are uh, prepared and doing the emergencies to do what's clean, safe, and easy. And um, thank you again, Tracy. I am delighted to present our next presenter. Lourdes Santabaya is from uh, Puerto Rico. She's the executive director of Alimentación Segura Infantil. And she, um, Lourdes, um, is has wears many, many hats. She has a master's in clinical nutrition. She's an IBCLC a certified birth and uh, postpartum doula, uh, ha a health coach, and a very, very ardent and strong um, community um, organizer. Uh, she has got, she is a recipient of USBC's um, Legacy Emerging Leader Award. She just got the Miriam Lavoque Award at the um, Breastfeeding and Feminism Conference last year, and we are so honored to have Lourdes with us today. Over to you, Lourdes. I'm going to pull out your slides. You know what? You can give me control of the computer because I think it's going to work better if I have the. Do you hear me? I do. I'm going to make okay. the presenter. Because I just put them up like as photos. I think it'll work better if you give me the. Perfect. Turn. OK. Of course. Wait, hold on, hold on one second. Yes, OK. You can see me? All right. Yeah, we see your screen. OK, and I'm going to do this again. How do I get rid of this thing? That doesn't go away, this thing? Uh, All you right. see oh. a I see your desktop now. Yeah, I see your slide. But you don't see the web with the go to webinar thing. It's fine. It's fine. All right. So I'm trying to make this big. Um, I'm speaking today and I'm a little bit hoarse. I'm sorry. I have a little bit of I have a cold that doesn't seem to want to go away. And um, I'm speaking from the perspective of somebody who lives in the community and is a community organizer. Uh, and I don't have all of the answers. Um, but I can say this. I'm an IBCLC. I was a, a La Leche League leader until very recently. Um, I'm a community organizer, I'm an activist, I'm a mother, um, and I had worked in the community organizations. Uh, I was and still I'm working on my master's degree, I don't have that yet, 
because of my my desire that I wanted to open a clinic when I um, graduated from my master's degree program, that the idea is that we were going to provide low, uh, affordable services to families and um, at, simultaneously provide training to community members because we ha we have a lot of good lactation systems in place. I have to give honor to many of the organizations that have come, come before me. Um, but for example, La Leche League is, is known to be more directed toward housewives. So it has more of its, of its core audience or group. And then there's an excellent, uh, there are excellent services here to train um, health professionals. So I have, to, I have to mention those. Puerto Rico has a unique uh, economic situation. And I would say like most of what you've heard, if you heard is maybe true, or there are a lot of rumors. Um, and uh, we were uh, already we were experiencing a big uh, loss of population due to the economic crisis. Um, to summarize, which is that our government has try, tried to go default on many loans that they were operating the gov government with. And because of Puerto Rico's colonial status and things that go beyond my understanding um, has not been permitted and we're being somewhat governed by a fiscal control board with very little money. And then the government was already cutting changing labor laws, cutting services um, for quite a while. So we were already experiencing a loss of population. And because we are US citizens, um, we are able to, uh, to move from Puerto Rico to the United States. It's not called immigration, unless you would call like moving from Tennessee to Kentucky to be immigration. And um, the other thing is because of the Zika crisis, the official government recommendation was try not to have babies until we figure this out. So already from 2016 to 2017, we had seen a significant drop in the infant birth population in hospitals. And then the other thing is that 85% um, of children in Puerto Rico are receiving WIC, so that some of the presentations that you've heard up until now are very relevant. Um, you heard about our breastfeeding statistics. We have good laws in place. We were, I was at the Breastfeeding and Feminism Conference last week and they were discussing laws. And the consensus when I asked people is that Puerto Rico seems to have the very best laws in place. For example, we have a breastfeeding, a breast milk substitute law, which states that the infant when in the hospital is cannot be fed a breast milk substitute without written authorization or in the case of a medical necessity. Um, and then we also have a birth companion law. Um, we have very strong, or we, they were stronger, they were reduced after labor reform, but very strong maternity leave laws, which is paid maternity leave. Um, and that's not just for government. We also have strong breastfeeding in public laws, which include um, criminal penalties for people who discriminate against breastfeeding parents. Um, so that's the background to, to let you know what's going on. Me, um, as an IBCLC and as an activist, uh, I was given a USBC scholarship two years ago and um, I was I had known people from traveling to ILCA conferences and when the group from Safely Fed, which is to make it clear, Safely Fed USA is not an organization. It's just a joint effort between NAPLC and between a number of community um, breastfeeding from uh, bre or breast milk or human milk promoting activists who wanted to educate families about infant and young child feeding. And I was invited in mid-August to be part of the effort right before Harvey was heading up. And I speak Spanish and um, I thought it was interesting. I remember the World Breastfeeding Week um, it, right after my daughter was born. And the theme was breastfeeding and emergency safe lives. And I had heard of IYCFE very recently because of some translation. But it just is interesting because right before all of a sudden Puerto Rico got hit is when I was invited to be part of this organization. So I personally learned something during Harvey, which is that in the US, there are a lot of families that don't breastfeed. And world IYCFE policy is very, very adamant about the necessity for cup feeding and maintaining breastfeeding. But that I, I can say that we learned that a lot of these risk-based messages about formula feeding isn't safe and um, being very negative about uh, breastfeeding is very alienating, even to breastfeeding families. So that's one thing I learned. So um, here I am working on breastfeeding US, uh, 
a safely fed USA when we are informed that Irma is going to hit us and all of the trajectories for Irma is that we were going to, you know, we, it was going to, I remember a, a, a meteorologist making a, a live on Facebook saying, we we're going to remember life before Irma and we're going to remember life after Irma, which actually she wasn't so far from the truth. Um, Irma did hit Vieques, which is one of the smaller islands and the, the upper northeast coast of Puerto Rico pretty badly. But mostly what happened was that we were in Puerto Rico, we were collecting aid to give to the to the smaller islands in the in the Caribbean as you know, and and people thinking, oh, you know, nothing's ever hit here for like 20 years and we're the uh, island of the lamb. When I remember it was a very fast moving storm because I just saw um, as of Thursday before the storm hit, it didn't even have a name and it hit land on Tuesday night and there was no avoiding the storm. And um, I'm pretty lucky where I live. I live on the North Coast. My house is made of cement. Um, this is just the, the screen that I have here, this image is, um, you know, my phone. We started getting the phone alerts. I say Irma kind of um, uh, tricked us because right after Irma, even though I was four days without electricity, um, we were able to, to walk to stores. We were, most businesses were open on generator. And although there's some areas that didn't have electricity, still don't have electricity since Irma. Most of us had our power restored before Maria, but Maria was two, two weeks later. So anyway, um, I thought I was doing everything right. I had a lot of ice this time because I learned from Maria that I had to have a lot of ice. Um, and, uh, but then, and this is an image right at where I lived, a tree, I live in front of a park, a tree fell right in front of my house. And the last two people that I sent text messages to, I said, I'm scared there's a tree in front of my house because um, I thought it was a projectile. But as it turned out, that tree shielded me from winds because many of my neighbors lost terraces and things on the roof and um, uh, their garage doors burst and their cars were, in, were uh, somehow damaged, but I didn't have a lot of damage. These are just images around where I live, the flooding in the park um, right after. Um, we went walking, that's in town. Um, but I think one of the strong, that's a gas station. One of the strongest things is that we, 100% of Puerto Rico was without electricity. Um, and 100% of Puerto Rico was without cell phone signal um, and how dependent we are. And then I make the joke, I say, you know, like in, in TV shows like The Walking Dead or many of these apocalyptic movies where they go and they drive up to a gas station and they're able to put gas in their car um, or, uh, or they go to a house that's been abandoned and they can and they can turn on the water. No, that's gonna ha not gonna happen because everything is run on electricity or generator. So literally, we had nothing for an amount of time, and that's when it became very clear to me as an organizer that um, no, that this dream that I had. This is when they cleared up path, and this is this is a, an idea of what's really happening in Puerto Rico. The government, it took a while for the government to open. Many offices were just three employees, a white table, and a paper roster. They had no telecommunication. I would see stores where people would just show up and it opened because three employees had opened. But for several weeks, new food didn't come in to the island and we were scared. The gas lines were um, sometimes 10 hours long and they would put a quota on the gas. You could get $20 worth of gas at a time. Um, the FEMA lines were long. Um, and uh, things were things things were as bad, and the stores didn't open. The stores didn't open Be, during Irma. Walmart had offered to store personal milk stashes in their freezers, and at least most of the WalMarts didn't open, and many of them were destroyed and needed to be um, rebuilt. Okay, the tree here shows when the kids outside my house. A lot of kids started playing outside, etc. But so a lot of um, this is a mo message from my mother. I said this is like a, a war, and she said, "Well, go out and fight like you're in the trenches." Um, so what I realized as soon as I was able to kind of like um, establish some sort of communication with the team in, of Safely Fed and um, I, I met with people from Save the Children is that I did my first IYCFE training. I was also on a webinar with Navelsi and my idea was if I do a very comprehensive infant and young child feeding uh, training and use my skills and nobody had any money, um, and I do it for free. The only thing that I would ask for people is in return, you have to reach 25 people. And then I started gathering my core group. And we were doing volunteer work out of an organization, a community organization that works with prenatal population called MOM. This is just a, like, what is the philosophy of my organization, which is heavily based on equity, on community building, 
um, combating systems of oppression and overcoming um, uh, the in, in equitable conditions which make um, food equity in, uh, difficult and recovering from um, a, a disaster for children. Uh, I, so we started having support groups. Um, and from the trainings that I was doing, we started um, uh, recruiting our, our core group members. Um, again, this is Yo Apoyo La Lactancia Humana. In Spanish, we tend to say uh, Lactancia Materna. It's very gendered language, and we're trying to change the discourse. Um, and um, to, this is the tree was later mutilated. It's part of the recovery from the storm. There's a lot of trash. And, uh, and you know, there wasn't an opportunity to replant some of the trees that were toppled over. Um, a lot of loss, a lot of loss of destruction. And where, again, where I live is very, doing pretty well. This is like an uh, uh, ironic the, a nativity scene because by Christmas still most people didn't have electricity. Um, and started doing um, some education, very important hand expression teaching. I, I can't tell you the number of families that I would, uh, I would attend. We know if you don't have electricity, there were a lot of milk stash that was dumped down the drain. A lot of working parents who are not able to use breast pumps without electricity or didn't have refrigeration at home. And although many people were dependent on generators, um, a lot of people can't afford that. There is some help for FEMA, from FEMA, but that's for um, families with health problems. There was discussion about, well, is an infant feeding a health issue? But some concerns from the Department of Health around sustainability of generators. Um, uh, education on bottle feeding, do, treating humanely, because since we realized a lot of families had to give up on breastfeeding, it meant that we had to do a lot of relactation. And whereas my experience, sometimes breastfeeding support groups without meaning to be, we um, are not um, empathetic to non-breastfeeding families. Um, we, we're not, they, they need to be treated with humanity and maybe they will come to our support groups if they know that you can breastfeed or you can bottle feed here. We're trying to do safe, safer feeding um, talking about, we do education about um, upcoming power outages again. Um, we are having all sorts of ongoing um, situations for, related to the recovery from the storm. Uh, we, this is a wave surge that happened a few weeks ago. We were under tsunami alert perhaps a few months ago. Still to this date, I would say about 20% of the population is without electricity and those are in the most marginalized communities. And, and I still have blackouts. There's still poor telecommunications. Um, uh, International Women's Day was recently, just showing you the kind of education we're doing with the public. Um, this is about water rationing. Um, and the growth of this organization is that now we have our core group members, which are located around the island. Let me see if I have this. Um, I have it put up here. Sorry. Okay, um, we have core group members who are like our spokespeople um, who are located around the island and I've trained them as infant and young child feeding specialists. Our emphasis is that breastfeeding is normal, it's natural and it's what's gonna get us through the, the, the apocalypse as I like to joke. Um, but that uh, we also need to talk about cup feeding, about paste bottle feeding, about bottle sanitation, about um, what do you do when you have water, when you don't have water, when you have electricity, when you don't have electricity? Because, for example, my experience in visiting the shelters, which is one of the first things that I did, is that in the shelters, they wouldn't give the families access to the kitchen. So absolutely no boiling or sanitation of feeding equipment was happening. And that at the three-week um, growth spurt or any growth spurt, the families that expressed that they didn't think they had enough milk were just given formula. Um, so not a lot of breastfeeding support happening in the shelters. Um, and, uh, so we had like going in that you can, you can, you can disinfect bot feeding equipment with, um, with Clorox if you have to. So just looking at all of the different range of possibilities. Um, we have a hotline now, my organization, um, active in different acti activities. We're distributing mosquito nets. We have a lot of connection with other community-based organizations. Um, and then this is an idea, let me show you this map if it's here, of where all of my team is, is located. But these are people who either receive stipends or who paid staff. But the hope is in the next few months, as part of a grant that we're working right now, we're gonna start a volunteer edit, uh, part 
of the organization. They're called Casicas, which is Consejeras en Alimentación Segura Infantil Comunitaria. Um, and it's, a, it's an acronym, which is a play on words for uh, an indigenous leader. Um, and uh, we, uh, we want to become an organization that we're trying to train people as well, because we believe that the, uh, the knowledge exists in the communities. So we want to uh, possibly be a peer one, a pathway one organization. If you're familiar with how the tracks, the pathways to become an IBCLC work. Um, so that our portavoces, our spokespeople, as well as the casicas could possibly be doing a pathway one and providing intense training. Because the idea here is, um, and I've been giving community-based trainings as well on what are the steps to become an IBCLC if you want to be. Just we want to build up this the training level and the skill amongst maybe if you are a health professional, because I have, for example, two registered nurses on our core group, but um, that you don't have to be a health professional to at least become trained as a breastfeeding counselor and that you could someday also become an IBCLC if you want to, or at least some sort of breastfeeding counselor in the community. So that's the model that I'm working on. And it's kind of, um, it's overwhelming. Sometimes I feel that I have something big in my hands. Um, and we're working with other government organizations. We do a lot of networking and meeting with, um, with statewide agencies. We're on the State Breastfeeding Coalition. We're on the Children's Task Force of Puerto Rico. We are working with the International Medical Corps. We're working with um, uh, the Safely, uh, uh, Save the Children. So we have a lot of uh, alliances. We just want to, um, to for things to improve. And then as you can see, this is like from what was before just a piece of paper and me reading with no electricity, the, the bullet points on an outline when I did my first presentation. Now many of us have electricity um, and we have uh, a PowerPoint presentation that we do in, uh, with the community um, training. So we do community IYCFE trainings, we do direct counseling, we do um, training of community members on breastfeeding um, and we're gonna grow a lot bigger. And um, my, my strong belief is that this is a time, there was a time before the storm that many of us, uh, like in any field, sometimes there's infighting, but th it's not really the case right now. This is the time for us to come together and make alliances. And um, the nonprofit model, I think is one that works very, very well. We don't bill for health insurance as IBCLCs in Puerto Rico. So we're looking at different models to get the information to the community. And um, I hope what I've presented has been informative. Great, thank you so much, Lourdes. Gosh, this is truly a testament to how the community comes together and why it's so important for everybody, uh, public health, healthcare, coalitions, community-based organizations to be working together. I hope, folks, I know we are 10 minutes away from close, but I hope you'll stay for our last presentation. Um, this is really critical and, um, I'm so uh, honored to introduce Dr. Anshali Palmquist, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Maternal and Child Health at the Carolina Global Breastfeeding Institute. And she, a, a lot of her research addresses the intersection of social ine inequality and breastfeeding disparities. And she does, um, I, I, YCFE is one of her specialties too. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Anshali. Thank you. And um, I just uh, really am honored to be here speaking with everyone. And um, thank you, Lourdes, um, for sharing us, your experiences, not only as someone who's been um, personally affected <clears throat> by um, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, but doing so much to um, focus efforts on um, improving equity and emergency response, particularly for infant feeding. So um, I'm going to try to just, I don't think that anything that I have to offer is um, unique from what's already been presented, but just to emphasize the importance of an equity lens when we're thinking about emergencies um, and, and particularly in uh, places like the United States where there wow. is enormous structural inequities <laughs> um, in how um, emergency response is rolled out um, and I think this statement that we you know emergencies produce and reproduce 
poverty and inequality, and they spring, bring structural violence into sharper focus. Um, communities that already are marginalized and are being affected disproportionately by structural inequities and racism, structural violence, are um, the first and the most vulnerable to be affected in, in disasters and emergencies, and the least likely to get um, the benefits of these you know, wonderful policies and protocols that are in place to um, bring about emergency response. But even in developed nations like the United States, we see, we have many examples of how um, different kinds of disasters and emergencies can create what is usually a resource rich setting into a resource poor environment. Um, and so, I just want to, you know, bring into focus this intersectionality lens. Um, there are a lot of different um, kinds of, you know, we th we think about mothers and um, infants as being a vulnerable population that is usually not prioritized in terms of emergency response. And when it comes to infant feeding or breastfeeding in particular, um, as Kat Sheely mentioned earlier, nobody knows where to put it. They think, you know, it's either, it either goes into food or it goes into medicine or it falls in the cracks. And um, so you can see all of these different kinds of things that are in place that normally are affecting mothers and babies in, in non-emergency settings that are just exacerbated when a disaster emergency arises. And even when we're sp speaking about breastfeeding or infant feeding, we have to think that that falls within a continuum of birth and what is happening after birth, so sexual and reproductive health and child protection. Um, you know, all of these things come into play and this having skilled lactation support, but also skilled infant feeding and emergency support is really critical. Um, in settings like the United States where there are high rates of mixed feeding and many families, you know, we, we know from past research that during emergencies and disasters, families who are breastfeeding before the emergency um, end up formula feeding for a number of reasons, um, not the least of which is due to lack of support. Um, and then I think just to remember that it, because of the history we have with racism and structural violence and Katrina, for example, um, even the, the things that are in place to provide population-based services are, they weren't developed with an equity lens. And so, you know, there might be uh, evacuation routes and there might be state-based um, resources and response available, but many times people within communities that have been affected by racism and structural violence are not gonna want to rely on those kinds of resources. And so they turn to their communities. And when communities themselves don't have that capacity to support lactation or to support education about um, in, in making um, artificial feeding safer, that creates this, you know, this cycle of um, vulnerability. So I'm gonna just quickly, a few folks have mentioned Safely Fed. We, um, Safely Fed, was a hashtag and it became um, a, an international voluntary, a volunteer network in response to um, displaced families throughout Europe as a result of the Syrian refugee crisis. And you can see that work at safelyfed.org. And that response was really um, to promote the global guidelines for infant feeding and emergencies as a form of community mobilization. So to get you know messages out about the kinds of things that are helpful in emergencies, the kinds of things to avoid, because um, in that situation, in, in the European um, refugee crisis, we saw um, a, a lack of uh, na na nation level and um, sort of state level um, response and lots of um, community mobilization around infant feeding. Um, so th that we kind of had the idea when the, hur the hurricane season began that we could maybe do a similar type of social media outreach campaign and a coalition of different organizations, including Black Mothers Breastfeeding Association, um, Napleseed, Health Connect One, Mom to Mom Global, Safely Fed Canada, and, as well as a number of um, just individuals kind of came together to do a kind of public awareness around infant and young child feeding and emergencies as a way to get messages to communities um, of color and communities that were be disproportionately affected. So Black Mothers Breastfeeding Association put together um, a 24-hour breastfeeding hotline um, staffed by a number of their volunteers who were skilled in providing information. And I think many of those in the early um, response were trying to refer and coordinate with the Texas um, Warm Line as well. Um, we had an, uh, developed a number of um, just basic messages for 
supporting breastfeeding in disasters because we're thinking that we want any family who is currently breastfeeding, we want to support them to continue breastfeeding as much as possible. That is sort of step one. Step two is that any families who are mixed feeding or not breastfeeding, you want to support them um, in being able to safely feed their babies um, in emergencies. So these kinds of messages are very common. There are a lot of misconceptions about the role of stress in breastfeeding during an emergency. Um, we tried to work with um, volunteers from within the community to develop images and messages that would be um, you know, appropriate for different kinds of communities. This message is um, feed the mother to feed the baby. Um, and so you can sort of see, I think the, the Facebook site is still in operation, but just, just try to get out messages um, that would be more com community based. So I, you know, I think um, if I, there's one sort of key takeaway, I, I would like to just say, you know, we having good emergency response um, and having those policies in place are extremely important. But we have to understand that just because the policies and protocols are in place. Um, because they weren't designed necessarily with an equity lens in mind, doesn't mean that they'll be quite as effective as we wish them to be. I think in moving forward that what we really need is greater community mobilization and everybody who is an IBCLC or CLC or peer supporter or who has, you know, is an emergency responder, in the time to start building capacity in communities um, is now before the emergency arrives. And so, you know, reaching out to your, your institutions where you practice, um, thinking about if you have a private practice, thinking about how to build capacity and build materials for the communities you serve in that regard. Um, talking to your hospitals about what kind of emergency plans that they have in place, Go, building capacity within community organizations like churches and schools, because these are often the places where many communities will turn when they need support if they're not comfortable going to the, the gigantic shelter or comfortable reaching out to um, some of the other um, organizations that are providing relief. I think the way that we protect communities of color in emergencies is really building that capacity from the ground up. And then we have multiple levels of a response, um, which hopefully translates into resilience. So I think I'll stop there because I know we're out of time. But thank you so much for the chance to uh, to speak and share in this panel. King Kenny, if you're talking, you're on mute. Oops, I did not realize that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anshali, and uh, to all of our panelists today, and just hearing from the different perspectives, from the federal, from the local agencies, and from all of the folks who are um, community-based, just how much coordination is needed from everybody uh, to be doing that to be better prepared for our next with uh, climate change and natural events happening more often and uh, you know at a greater scale um, um, our communities will continue to be um, targeted um, disproportionately and how do we do that as um, upscale uh, up, upstream as much as we can uh, support breastfeeding um, 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 duration but when the emergency happens make uh, you know every mother has to be supported in the way that she needs to be we need more training of rescue workers in safe infant feeding we need to advocate breastfeeding with relief agencies and as dr palmquist says there's so much that we all can do since we are out of time we are going to continue this discussion on the forum we have a lot of great questions and comments that we are going to take back to our panelists and probably put together in a blog and have you answer or put it on our um, <coughs> um, discussion forum. So thank you again to each one of our panelists and to you all for all you do. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>